now. My name is Joe Albahari. I'm the uh, No Riley author. And I'm also the dude that wrote Linkpad. It's, uh, who's, who's used Linkpad here? Okay, probably more than half. I've had an interest in concurrency and multi-threading for a long time. I wrote an extensive article on the net, which is available for free. And I uh, did a quite a big section in the book on recently on parallel programming. And we're going to start with a recap of that. And in particular, the move that we've got now from a sort of multi-core towards many-core. And then in the second half of the session, we'll look at what's coming in the future. There's a, a CTP out now, which is quite exciting, which content takes parallelism to the new level in terms of what you can do with it and the places you can go with it. We'll look at that. I've drawn a, a chart here of, uh, this is a logarithmic graph of clock speeds over the past 25 years. And um, you can see that what's happened is that we've pretty much flatlined and that doesn't mean that Moore's law has stopped. Instead, Moore's law has gone in a new direction. And that is that we're getting more calls. Uh, that, that was a prototype recently that Intel released, an 80-core processor. I wonder if there's a mobile edition of that. <laughs> <laughs> now, they gave us three APIs in Framework 4 for parallel programming. The two higher level APIs in orange and the lower level API below the tasks. They also gave us a set of concurrent collections in the system.collections.concurrent namespace. And these collections, it's not just about thread safe collections. They are tuned to work very, to scale very well and they are hit with massive amounts of concurrency. So when you've got dozens or hundreds of threads hitting them at once. Now, all of this is built on top of the CLR thread pool. And this is something they did a lot of work in in Framework 4 to enhance its performance and make it bet work better with parallel programming. Now, the thread pool has two jobs. The first job is to reduce the latency or avoid the latency from spinning up a new thread, which normally might take a few hundred microseconds. The CLR thread pool has threads already ready to go. The other job is to avoid oversubscription. Now, what is oversubscription? It's when you've got more threads than you've got cores. Now, that's bad because it causes the, the processor, or rather the operating system, has to time slice. And every time it time slices, that context switch incurs a cost, performance cost. But moreover, something else it does is it tends to invalidate the CPU memory caches. And these memory caches are important because it's one of the things they're giving us to try and make this, the processes work faster without increasing the clock rate. Now, how does it avoid oversubscription? It's actually a really tricky thing to do because it doesn't know what other processes are running on your machine and what threads they're using. It doesn't even know what other threads are running in the same process. It's very difficult for it to know uh, what those threads are doing and when they're, whether they're blocked or whether they're actually making the calls hot. So it's got a very clever way to avoid oversubscription. And what it does is that once it gets 100% utilization, it starts to throttle the workload. So it starts experimenting and says, what happens if I start restricting the amount of work that's going into the it onto the, the CPU. If performance improves, it keeps doing that. And it keeps doing it until it gets to the point where performance gets worse. And then it starts increasing it again and says, is that going to make it better? That's called a hill climbing algorithm. It's a feedback loop. That's how it optimizes. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is there are two things you can do to screw it up, to make its job very difficult. One of them is to block on pulled threads, like enter a wait, sleep, join state for a significant period of time. Now, typical, when, when we're doing that, we're doing I.O. bound tasks. And I.O. bound task is any job that takes a while to run without making a core hot. So downloading a web page, for instance, is an example, or sleeping. Now, when you do this, um, the, the 
CLR really doesn't have a reliable way to know that you're doing it. And, and so it has to, uses heuristics to deal with it. And it does a reasonable job. But if you're trying to get the, the, the most performance out of this, let's say you, you run something, you parallelize it, it works well on two cores, you run it on four or eight or 16, you're not getting the gains you hoped you were getting. These are the kind of details you've got to look at. Are you upsetting the thread pool by, by putting blocking tasks on there? The other thing you can do to upset it is to run any task that takes longer than around maybe 200 milliseconds. Long running tasks. Why is that bad? Because it has very few opportunities to measure and adjust in terms of the hill climbing. So keep your workloads, try and keep them less than 100 milliseconds. In fact, a good zone is between a microsecond and 100 milliseconds. Why around a microsecond? Because any less than that, and the overhead of managing it starts to erode some of your savings. So, how do we do parallelism? Most of them, about, they're about the concept of fork join. So we take a compute intensive task, we split it up into tasks, run them on threads, join them back together. The APIs that we've got to do that, P-Link and Parallel Loops do that for you automatically. Um, and that's kind of called structured parallelism. P-Link is built on link, which is functional or declarative. You say what you want, and it works out how to do it. In contrast, the other two are imperative. You say how you want to do it. Those two imperative APIs are known as the task parallel library. Another important concept is task versus data parallelism. Let's say you've got 24 data items, and you've got four tasks. Now, if you've got four cores and you want to distribute the work over those, and let's say that for every task, we want to run that task over every data item. There are two ways we can do this. We can assign one thread per task and have each run over all the data items. Problem with doing that is that they're going to have to lock each of these to get thread safety. And that locking is not only a problem in terms of uh, making sure you get the thread safety right, it creates contention, which becomes more and more of a problem the more calls you get. The other way to do this is to do data parallelism. Divide the data up amongst the threads instead of the tasks. Now, not only is this more scalable because you tend to have more data items than you have tasks, it also avoids contention and locking. P-Link and Parallel Loops both help you with data parallelism. So we'll look briefly at P-Link. This is the highest level API. It's fully declarative and it transparently parallelizes link queries. Now you're probably used to seeing link queries like this. This is query and a query expression in C-sharp. The compiler translates it to a series of method calls. And then when you run that, what does it look like at runtime? What does this actually create in memory? It creates uh, a, a series of conveyor belts, a production line. So the input elements over here, they start up and they work their way across the production line to the end. This is very easy for to be for P Link to parallelize because all it has to do is create multiple pipelines. So it takes the elements and distributes them amongst the pipelines. We've got two in this case. It's got two strategies for allocating the input items to the pipelines. It can do what's called chunk partitioning, where it takes one or two elements from the, from the input sequence, gives them to the first one. The next one does the same. It grabs more elements. And then when they finish processing, they go back to the enumerator and they keep grabbing chunks. Now, that's a very fair system. The problem is that if your work items execute very quickly and you've got lots and lots of them, it creates a contention on the enumerator. It has to lock around the enumerator, and that's a bottleneck if your items execute quickly and there's lots of them. The other strategy it uses, uh, and it tries to use a strategy if you've got an input sequence that implements iList or that's an array, and it's called range partitioning. That what that range partitioning does is it pre-allocates all of the items onto the various conveyor belts. That avoids that contention. Only problem is what happens if, if one um, conveyor belt happens to get the easy items and it finishes first. Right? It's going to end up doing nothing while the others kind of are finishing their work. What is supposed to happen at that point is it's, 
is the, is the guy that finishes first, he's supposed to do what's called work stealing and help out the other guys finish their job. The only thing is that they never got round to implementing work stealing with P-Link. So uh, this can sometimes cause a performance issue. So it's worth thinking about this and you can actually force chunk partitioning with P-Link. Um, and I've got, if you go to my website, on, I search for my surname, Threading, I've got an, an article, an extensive article on P-Link, how to do that, how to force uh, chunk partitioning because it can sometimes work better. Before we do that, let's, let's do a brief demo. So most of you know what have used, have used LinkPad. I'm using it as a code scratch pad in C Sharp. And in the spirit of the keynote, we're going to calculate prime numbers. So this calculates um, the, the first million or 10 million prime numbers and, and dumps the first 100 out to... Here it is. And now the nice thing about how this works is, is, is not important. What's important is that we can parallelize it simply by calling as parallel and that now invokes P-Link. And we get the same result now, but we, it, we get it a lot faster. You'll notice that the, the, the output order, the order of the results is not necessarily the same as the order that the, the values went in. P-Link does mess with your ordering unless you tell it otherwise. Now, your query obviously needs some meat. If it executes very quickly to begin with, there's not much to gain from parallelizing it. We've seen, we've talked about ordering, and functional impurity means that if you've got a, a method that you're calling within your query that accesses shared state without locking, then it's going to cause trouble. And even if you do lock, it's still going to cause trouble because it creates contention, and we're trying to avoid contention if we want this thing to be scalable. Now, one thing you can do that's quite cool with P-Link is aggregations. So um, this is an example of calculating the root mean square. Hopefully, it would use more than six numbers in real life. But imagine you've got an array of millions of numbers. You want to calculate the root mean square. It's pretty much a freebie, right? Do you want to parallelize that? That's all you have to do. So this is a nice thing about P-Link, is that you get almost for free, parallelism for free, in terms of programming time. Um, that does standard deviation. Again, that's, I don't think you could write that in, in less code anyway. You could do it. So um, this is a nice feature of P-Link. Now, you can do IO-bound queries. You can download 10 web pages at once, if you want, with P-Link, if you force the degree of parallelism. If you don't force it, it will undersubscribe, it will tend to do that um, because it assumes they're compute bound. But nowadays, um, as I said, let, you, you want to try and avoid blocking pulled threads. This is users pulled threads. So I would advise against using this for uh, IO bound queries if you've got the option of a better approach. What, what will be an example of a better approach? Anyone? How else might you download five web pages at once without blocking any threads. Await, oh, yep, that's one great way, is the, the new async functions. There's something else, there was a session yesterday demonstrating interesting technology that can do this, that can deal with asynchronous. Rx, Rx reactive framework, that's another way to do it. Okay, so let's look now at parallel loops. Two static methods, and what these methods do is the equivalent of the C sharp for and for each loop, but parallel versions of it. So here's a C sharp for loop, and here's how we parallelize it with parallel dot for. It's pretty simple to use. What's really cool about parallel dot for is it does range partitioning with work stealing. So if you need the best possible performance you can get, this will give it to you. Again, keep your workloads, you, um, the work items, it, roughly in that range to get the, the, the most out of it. And don't even try using parallel loops for IO bound work because you can't force the degree of parallelism. So those are the uh, two high level parallel APIs. We'll look now at the bottom level. 
Now, there are two ways you can do task parallelism. One is with parallel.invoke. This static method, it just takes an array of action delegates, executes them all in parallel, and then waits until they finish. Again, that uses range partitioning with work stealing. So it's a very good method to use. The task, or the task of T result class, that is the kind of bottom layer upon which everything else is built. A task represents a concurrent operation. This is becoming more and more important. If you don't know about tasks, who, know, who who's doesn't know about tasks or has not used them or is unfamiliar with them? So almost everyone knows about tasks. That's great. So I won't spend too much time on this. It's a concurrent operation, and there are kind of two ways to use it. One is for multi-threading, which is where you give it a delegate and you say, execute this delegate on something, which is by default the thread pool. Now, this is how it works with parallel programming. And it needs to work in conjunction with a task scheduler. That's what actually does all the work. This guy here, it's really just a signaling construct, right, with a, with a, with a result property. The task scheduler does all the work. How do you, do you use it? You use that, that method there, task.factory.startNew. That gets you in. Uh, that creates a task scheduler or uses the default task scheduler if you don't specify one, which targets the thread pool. So an example is, I've, I've got here an example on starting a task. I've got a method to calculate the number of prime numbers there are in the first five million natural numbers. And now I'm starting that on a pulled thread using task.factory.startNew. That gives us the result. Now, the return value, um, you can also have it return a value. So instead of having us just dump out the result, this is equivalent to calling console.writeLine, we can have it just, have the lambda just return an expression which returns an int, then we end up with the task of int. And then that has a result property that, that where we can access that, that result. And so if I run that, we get the same result now. The only thing is that's taking a while to run. And, I, and I, you remember what I, was t what I said about uh, trying to keep your workload small, like around 100 milliseconds? This takes a lot longer than 100 milliseconds. Now, if this was a one-off, it's no big deal. But if we're doing a lots of this, you probably want to get your workloads down. Um, or else there's another way of doing it, which is you can use this task creation options dot long running. And this tells it that, that it is a long running operation and it can either run it on another thread or it can tell the pool, hang on, this is going to be long running and it adjusts its heuristics accordingly. Now when you access the result of a task and the task hasn't finished, which will be the case here, it will block until it's finished which isn't always what you want, because again, if you're on a pooled thread, you want to try and avoid blocking. And generally, it affects scalability when you do a lot of blocking. So how do we get around this? How do we access a task's result without actually waiting for it to complete? Reactive framework? Well, giving up too soon, surely, with tasks. Callback? callback? Is there another name for a callback? Hmm? Delegate? A future? A fu that future's an interesting word because um, the, the task, the generic version of task, task event, this was originally called a future when they came out with the CTP because it represents an integer in the future. Now, the other word for a callback in this scenario, it's not a synonym, but in this scenario, is a continuation. What we want to do is we want to say to that task, when you're finished, continue by doing something else. And then we can exit. No blocking. So here's the, what I've done now. As I've said to that task, when you're finished, continue by dumping out the result. Then we return. So when I run this query, you'll notice it finishes immediately. And then in a few seconds later, the result pops out onto the screen. So that, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on continuations in the next session. Because continuations um, very quickly turn into a massive nightmare. Um, and what they've done in C Sharp 5 is they've built support for continuations into the language. 
This will change the way you program when it comes to concurrency. It makes continuation so trivially easy, you don't even realize that you're doing them. So we've seen one use of tasks. The other one, you can use tasks purely as a signaling construct um, or a value-added signaling construct because tasks have a result property and they have an exception property. And this is what we do for I.O. bound stuff. And again, in the next session, I'll go into how this works, how you use a task completion source, which is the driver, where you take over a task and you just drive it, rather like a manual reset event, because that way you can use them without having to use threads at all. OK, so let's have a look at a, uh, a we'll use, we'll, um, write a demo now. We'll start off in, in Visual Studio. Uh, when I was a kid, about 15, at the, the Apple II was the latest computer that was out. And, um, and I wrote a program to, I was pretty geeky back then. I still am now. And I, I wrote a program to uh, calculate ma the Mandelbrot fractal on the Apple II, but you had to write it all in, in machine code because that was the only way to get the speed. So I thought it would be cool to do it now in C Sharp with all our parallel programming libraries. Um, and what I've done is I've created a VS project which has a class to render a Mandelbrot frame. Uh, and it renders it into, into this array, this unsigned integer array of RGB values. And that way I can reference this project and then use it from other places. So there's the constructor. We take the set bounds uh, of the, the set we want to render and the resolution that we want to render it into. And whether we want to render it now, that's the method that does all the work. And I've also got methods in here to extract the result as a Windows Forms image or a WPF bitmap source. And there's a method there which encodes it, uh, takes the result, encodes it into the PNG format so I can save it to a graphics file to disk. And this thing here lets you zoom in on a portion of the, of the area. It does the calculation like the new rectangle you want. So um, we'll check this builds, which I think it does. And we'll go to Linkpad and we'll run it from there. So I've created a, a query and I've added a reference to that, to that Mandelbrot DLL. And so we're instantiating a frame. We're getting the, the Windows Forms image and we're dumping it out. So let's run that and see what happens. And there's the Mandelbrot. Now that's a bit boring. It'd be nice if we could click on this and zoom into parts of the set. So I've written another one which does that. So it creates a WinForms picture box and, and then it handles the click event. But um, even cooler, what I've done is I've, I'm actually rendering it on a timer so that we can actually watch it as it's rendering. So I'll run that now and we can start clicking on this and zooming into parts of the set. What you'll notice, though, pretty quickly is it starts getting pretty slow. Right? Because this is a, a pretty a CPU-intensive job. So what we can do is go back to the, uh, the VS project where we've written that class, and we're going to the render method. Now, the implementation here is unimportant. Uh, the only thing we care about is that there's a for loop in there which calculates each of those, th those scan lines, goes down vertically to the horizontal lines. We can change that from a sequential for loop into a parallel for loop just like that. That's all we have to do. Now remember, this does range partitioning with work stealing, the coolest form of parallelism. So let's rebuild that and run this again. And now you can see the difference it's made. But what's really nice is you can, if you watch carefully, you can actually see the work stealing in progress because if one of those stripes finishes early, it will start then helping all the other stripes. And so you'll get these multiple layers of stripes. So you watch the top one now, it'll start helping the others. Now, I was pretty happy with this. Um, <laughs> I thought, you know, mission accomplished here. I, have to, I can leave now. The other thing I did is that whenever you click, I'm writing out the, you can, you can write out the uh, result to the console. So these, these are the rectangle of the set that I'm rendering. And I'm doing that because I can just take this and copy and paste it into another program that I've written. And this other program is going to do something even cooler. It's going to render all these images 
to PNG files and save them to the disk so that I can replay this really quickly. Now, that would be nice, but what would be better is it, if it actually did a smooth zoom in. So if it took these, say, two rectangles and worked out all the rectangles between them, so it took, say, 20 rectangles between them, and then I could work out, I could work out the set for each of those, save them to an image file, write them to disk, and that's like my video. I can, I can play that back. So um, I, I went back to the VS thing and wrote an extension method called interpolate, which takes an innumerable of rectangle, and then it works out that number of frames and gives you all the intermediate frames. That was the first step. And um, then I wrote the program, and I've actually pasted in here um, a whole series of rectangles. So I'm using a link query to uh, split those up, parse them into rectangles, and then call this interpolate function to create 15 intermediate rectangles. Um, and then we're going to do our processing pipeline. So we're going to first render by creating that frame and put render now true. Then I'm going to call the encode to PNG method to encode that to the graphics file. And the final step is to save it to a file in my, uh, on this folder on the hard disk. So let's run this now and see what happens. You notice it's spending quite a lot of time encoding. Kind of interesting, isn't it? It takes you know, almost as long to encode as it does to calculate the whole set. I'm using the WPF encoder to do that, which is actually quite slow. So we can go and have a look at what it's doing on the hard drive now. So we'll go to Mandelbrot. And you can see these are all the frames that, are, that it's done. You can see that slow zooming effect. Okay, it's done. And now I've written another query which um, uses uh, WPF this time. A WPF, because it's a bit faster, the, the um, bitmap image. And I'm using an image control. Uh, and I'm going to, every 50 milliseconds, I'm actually using, I've not been, I've talked about this yet, that'll be the next session, but the await keyword is a really cool way to avoid the need, you'll never need to use a timer again in WPF or WinForms with that keyword. So what I'm doing is I'm telling it to show one frame every 50 milliseconds. So let's run that now and see what it looks like. Okay, well, there is a problem that we've got with this. <laughs> I, I couldn't stop there. The problem is that the speed up we're getting from parallelizing this wasn't anything like as much as I was hoping. And what, what was really bad was that if we added 1632 cores, the, the speed up we'd get would be actually very small. And we've run into something called Amdahl's Law. Who's heard of that? Uh, Amdahl's law states that when you're trying to parallelize something, the maximum degree of speed up you can get by adding more cores is governed by the portion of the algorithm that must run sequentially. So let's say you've got an algorithm, half of it is parallelizable, and the other half has to run sequentially. What is the maximum speed up you could get, assuming infinite number of cores? Mm? Yes, you could, it could be twice as fast. That's as good as you could ever get. So this is a prob problem here because what's happened is that we're... Our first phase here with the rendering, that's fully parallelizable. This phase of encoding it using the WPF encoder, this, can't, this is not parallelizable. This, is, this runs sequentially. And writing it to the disk runs sequentially, although that happens quite quickly. So, the thing is, how do we deal with this problem? And the, the, my first idea was to take the parallelism out of the rendering and instead parallelize this for each loop here. But that causes a whole lot of other problems. One of them is that, you know, I was talking about keeping your workload small. We'll be actually giving it really big chunks to work with, which is not good for the hill climber. The other thing is we'll be parallelizing the saving to disk. And particularly on a laptop hard drive, 
running eight or 16 of these at once is, is not cool, right? And if it, if it was slow, then uh, we're running I.O. bound stuff. We're mixing I.O. bound, compute bound stuff, and we're trying to tell the CLR to parallelize it with eight or 16, 32 cores. It's not a good recipe. So um, it, it would also mess up the ordering. But worst of all, if we parallelize that for each, it rules out a whole, using uh, parallelism for a whole class of problems where, let's say, imagine that instead of having those coordinates already there, they were coming in real time. So a coordinate comes in, another one comes in, another one comes in, um, and we want to, in real time, render that through our pipeline and get it spit it out as quickly as possible. So it's not just about getting all the cores hot, we want to minimize latency. There's a whole class of problems, like, for instance, um, imaging, face recognition, uh, stock market, uh, tickets, um, investment banking, manufacturing, where you've got a lot of data coming in quickly. You want to do some very compute intensive work on that. You want to use all the calls, you want to parallelize it, and you want to get it out as quickly as possible. In this instance, it would be no good to parallelize things that come in in different points in time. We want to parallelize within that block as much as possible. And we've only got part way there with the, the libraries we've got at the moment. To solve this, uh, we need something else. And that something else is what's been provided to us in a new CTP called Dataflow. If you're familiar with um, any of these libraries here, has anyone used any of these libraries in green? CCR, that's a robotics library, then you'll know what Dataflow is about. But if you've not used them, there's no point in explaining this. <laughs> so um, to t tell you what Dataflow is about, um, it's probably best if I start with a story. I grew up in, in New Zealand. Um, and my first, so I'm actually a Kiwi. Um, my first real job over there, and I know what you're thinking, it's got something to do with sheep. <laughs> um, and you'd actually be quite right. Because um, uh, was, I was working in a factory that made uh, electric fence energizer units. And these are things that they clip onto the top of the fence wires to give 10,000 volt jolts. And that keeps the sheep in the paddock. And my job in the factory was to uh, design a system to computerize the testing of the uh, energizer units. And that was a massively fun project. And when uh, I came up with some very cool ways to make it work better than, than they'd planned. And they had a production line of, of seven people in testing and packing. And when I installed that system, they only needed one person. So I asked, what are you going to do with those other six people? And they said, we'll distribute them uh, in the rest of the factory. And I looked at the factory, and it was massive. Because every energizer that's produced has to be made from, from circuit boards, which have, each of those have to be manufactured from more components. And each of those have to be made from the materials. You have to wind the coils and so on. And this provides a very good analogy for parallelism. So what's gonna, what I'm going to do you and me, we're going to run the factory. We're going to produce one energizer. So we've got our raw materials here. We're going to start our production lineup. We're going to make the circuit boards. Now we've got the circuit boards, we can assemble them into the sub-assemblies, and then we've got an energizer. And that's pretty cool, but our quota is to make a thousand for the day. So we start again. That with our raw materials make our components, make our circuit boards, put them together, we've got the final product. Now, can you see we've got a problem here with parallelism? It's pretty good at the beginning. It gets worse and worse. At the end here, we've only got one worker busy. Right? Would, go out of, would I go out of business pretty quickly if we ran our production line like this? But this is analogous to that, that Mandelbrot problem we had. And this is analogous to a lot of problems in computer science where you're trying to parallelize. This is Armdahl's law. So how does a factory solve this? Well, imagine that every time a production line finishes, 
it starts speculatively producing another item in case it's needed. Let's see what happens then. We've got full utilization, right? This is how factories work. But there is a catch. This will never work in practice. Why not? Exactly. They, 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 each queue runs at a different speed. So you're still going to get a lot of waiting. So if you look around a factory to see how they solve that problem, you'll see small stockpiles everywhere of components. They've got buffers in there to solve that problem. And once you put the buffers in there, you can now actually make this work in real life. The algorithm they have for allocating workers to the production line is actually quite simple. What they do is they monitor the size of these buffers. And if they exceed a, a, a certain size, which would potentially satisfy any rhythm of consumption, then they temporarily suspend that production line. And those workers do a shift somewhere else where there's a bottleneck. Now, with that very simple formula, you can get excellent CPU utilization, as well as having very low latency through the production line. Now, this system wasn't, uh, in terms of computer science, this wasn't invented by Microsoft. This has been around for a long time. And it's, the, the model is called, the, these green conveyor belts are called actors. And actors, a central feature is that they are isolated. So the only way those actors interact with the rest of the world is by accepting input messages and emitting output messages. This is very important to have this isolation. Why? It kind of relates to quantum physics. If you, if you have a look at the system, at the, because each one runs at different speeds, it's impossible to predict or know the order in which things will get done. And this is weird, isn't it? Because normally when we program, the order of execution is essential. Everything breaks down unless we know the order. But here things can happen in random order. And, but what's even more interesting is that if you put a debugger there to watch the order of execution, <laughs> right, that's going to steal some compute cycles, right? And it changes the outcome. So the, the very act of observing changes the outcome. And that's the analogy with quantum physics. In fact, that's what inspired the actor model. But because of that isolation that I was talking about, these, the only way they, they can interact is by taking messages in and, and sending them out. It doesn't matter. The order of execution does not matter. This system will just work. Now, these, these are called blocks. In, in Microsoft Dataflow, these are called blocks. And they've given us nine kinds of blocked, blocks grouped into um, three categories. And a block, you can think of it, every block has some kind of built-in buffer. Right? This is all about buffering. If you don't need buffering, you don't need data flow. So um, the most basic kind is an action block. Uh, an action block is like the end of a production line. It eats things. So you construct it by passing a delegate, an action delegate that takes a T input item. And when you send it an item, it then processes that item. Gone. So let's say it takes a while to process. Another item comes in, they get queued up. So let, let's kick that off and run a um, demo and action block. So I've, I'm creating one here, a new action block of int. And the function I'm going to run, whenever an integer comes into the system, I'm just going to write it out to the console. Then I'm going to feed it 10 items using the, the post method. So to run that and 10 numbers come out. That's pretty boring, right? Let's say, though, we can make this more interesting by putting a delay in there. So now I'm going to wait. I'm going to sleep for a second and then write out the number. Then we're going to put 10 in there. So what's going to happen now when we run that? Right, these 10 things, they'll all, they'll all queue up. So we'll run that again. It's, it's finished posting, and now it's starting to pull them out of the queue. You've kind of got to imagine that happening. Well, actually, you don't, because um, the latest LinkPad beta has got a visualizer for data flow blocks. 
So if you dump out the block, you can actually watch it happening. <laughs> so the blue items are input, and the, the red is the, what's being executed. Now, I did tell you um, earlier about... Um, thanks. I told you earlier about, about blocking on the thread pool. And what are we doing there? Now, this is, this is not cool if, if you want scalability, because remember, the whole idea of data flow is we're getting into some serious parallelism. We're going to be mixing I.O.-bound, compute-bound stuff. We should not be doing this. The only thing is it's incredibly difficult not to block with, um, with the current version of C-sharp. Um, but that's all changing, as we'll see in the next session. And um, this is actually the way you would do it now in C-sharp 5. This will probably ship with C Sharp 5 for real. I mean, you can actually use Dataflow right now, just like you can use AC. Everyone gets an automatic Go Live license, in effect, which is kind of cool. But um, this is the way you would do it in C Sharp 5. You get the same result, um, and you, all you do is you add these extra keywords in there, and off it works. Now, because we've not gone into this yet, I'm going to go back to the old way of doing it using a sleep, but this isn't what you do in real life. Yeah, sure. Um, the original yes. Okay, the que question was about IO completion ports, what's done with that. If you use the um, asynchronous methods that we'll discuss in the next session, it will push, it, it will thunk down to the uh, APM and that will use those IO completion ports. Yes. You would. As soon as you, if you await something that uh, uh, thunks to the APM, which is any of the new methods that are provided for I.O., that will call you back on the on I.O. completion port. Now, if you've got multiple blocks, um, whether or not they're linked, and we'll look at linking in a moment, the blocks will execute in parallel. However, within a single block, no parallelism takes place by default, unless you tell it to, by increasing the max degree of parallelism from the default of one to something else. So in this case now, we've got um, two items running at once. And we can demo that again in, in, um, in LinkPad. I've set now, uh, passed in a, in an execution data flow block options class, and we can set the max degree of parallelism to two. So now we get two things running at once. Now, there are two ways you can kind of use data flow. Um, you can use it kind of in a batch processing way, or you can use it for a real-time system. So in the latter sense, you set up your network and you wait for the data to come. And in a sense, there is no end to the data. It's, it, the end is when you shut down your machine. The other th way you can use it, though, is for batch processing. Some people, you know, you've got this data like with our Mandelbrot, and we just want to put it through and then end, shut the thing down. If you want to do that, um, you can complete a block. So you can say, when you finish posting, you can call the complete method on it. And that says it will accept nothing else. And it has a um, tar, exposes a task on there called completion. And you can wait that task out. Or if you're using um, C sharp 5, you can just put await um, ab.completion. So um, we can run that now. So we need to add the async stuff. Maybe our completion that should be. And now when it's finished, it shows completed here. So we, you can then, um, when you complete the block, it then says no more items are coming in. And that completion then will be triggered when... Um, the, all of the, the items in the queue have been processed. Now, the next kind of block is called a transform block. And um, this is kind of like a link select, where you take an item and you transform it into something else. So you give it a function, um, and it takes one item, 
and transforms it into another item. So what happens is it goes into the queue and it changes colour, like from T input. If T input's blue and T output's green, it's now changed it to green. And it stays into the buffer until you do something with it. Now, in the documentation, they describe a transform block as having an input buffer and an output buffer, but I actually find it's much more helpful to think of it as having one buffer. So stuff goes into that one buffer and then it works in place. It processes items on that buffer in place. So here's a transform block, and now I'm going to sleep again for a second, and I'm going to return i times 10. So this transform block takes an integer of the input, and the output's an integer, and the function is to multiply that integer by 10. We're going to post 15 items to that and dump them. So now you can see it's changing from blue to green. So it's going from the input side, then moving on to the output side of the queue, and now each one is multiplied by 10 as it works its way through. There's also something called a transform many block. Who's used select many in link? Okay, this is a similar thing. Um, for each input element, it can output zero, one, or many output elements. So in this case, I've got an input element, and I'm, it, it's em emitting two output elements. Typically, um, you, you also want to be able to get stuff out. So how do you get stuff out of a transform block? And um, there are, there are um, cool ways and not so cool ways to do it. So the easy kind of but not so cool way is to put receive. And that waits synchronously for an item and, so you, it, and pulls it out of the, the output. That's the asynchronous version. Um, if you're familiar with, who's familiar with Reactor Framework? Anyone here used it? Very few people. But if you've used it, you can, I won't go into too much detail then, you can call as observable. And, and it, it gives you, this has kind of got a lot of parallels to Reactive Framework. And it's actually designed to work in conjunction with Reactive. Because a lot of the operators that Reactive provides, um, this doesn't. And the reason they don't provide it is they expect you to use it with Reactive. So by calling this, um, you've, you're creating now an observable. And you can um, use all of those uh, op Rx operators on there. And Linkpad lets you dump observables too. So I can just put um, tb.asobservable.dump, and that will dump out all of the, uh, the output items now so in, the, uh, in the transform block. So those are, the, um, those are two ways to get data out. But the coolest way is to link it to another block. And this is really what they intend you to do. So in this instance, I'm linking a transform block into an action block. Um, there's a link method, and you link them at runtime. This is also like a difference with Reactive, where you kind of set up your compositions uh, statically. So you link it at runtime, and what happens is whenever an item goes into the output side of the buffer here, it automatically gets then picked up by that action block over there. So let's run that. Okay, let's run that again, and let's say now it gets stuck, because it's taking a long time to run in that action, and more items come in. You've got the ability with these to limit the size of the buffer. By default, these have infinitely big buffers, but we could say, hey, four items only in that buffer. This is very useful to do. So let's say I've limited it to four items in that buffer. What happens if I feed it more items. It's, what it does is it defers those items. It says to the guy that sent it the item, um, I can't take this right now, but I might come back to you later and take it. So it's called deferring or postponing it. Now what that block does then, that the transform block, it says, is there anyone else that's linked to me? You can link multiple blocks to a preceding blocks. So in this instance, we've linked two action blocks. Now, when you link two blocks, it doesn't work like you might expect. It doesn't say, I'm going to give one element there, and the next one there, and the next one there, and the next one here. It gives all of the elements to the first block until it defers, until it says, sorry, can't take any more. Then it gives all the elements to the next block until it can't take any more. 
So now, they're all going to go into the next one. Let's say that one's got a long running task too. This is taking forever to run. And let's say more items come in again. What's going to happen now? Is they're just going to get stuck on the output side of the transform block. So now we're in a situation where it's going to start putting back pressure on anything that's feeding it. And, but what's more, this can't actually do anything. It can't make the calls hot. This is a good thing. Why is that good? It, exactly. The thread can be used elsewhere. So this, is, this stops that production light, suspends it. So now all the hands can go to these pumps here, which is the bottleneck. If particularly if you had enabled the max degree of parallelism on this to greater than one. Right? We should have really enabled the max degree of parallelism to four on here so that this will now they'd all be spinning and everything will be trying to clear that bottleneck. So this helps to not only get good parallelism, but to minimize latency throughout the system. So we can demo this. So I've created two action blocks. Each one's going to block for a whole minute. So they're basically that's the item that was stuck at the end. And then I'm using the link to method to connect the uh, transform block to each of those action blocks. We'll post 12 items and we'll dump them out. And now you can see that state exactly that we had before where we've got now um, each of these has got one item processing, three in the input buffer, and that plus one indicates that there's, it's postponed messages. It's saying, can't handle any more now, but maybe in the future. And this guy here has got now full stuck you know, on the output side of its buffer. OK, so knowing everything we know about, about uh, action blocks and transform blocks, can we, can we go back to that Mandelbrot problem now and improve the, the uh, parallelism on that? Um, and before we do that, there's one other block I want to briefly talk about, and I can just mention it. And there's one called a buffer block, and that's purely a buffer. So it's like a um, transform block without the transformer. So it's just a pure buffer. And you can actually use it um, like a, for producer-consumer scenarios just by calling the methods on it. Um, but we can also, it's very useful to put in between other blocks because what I've found is it tends to work uh, better when you keep, you bound the buffers to a fairly small number, and if you need a larger buffer, put a separate buffer block between it. It makes it conceptually simpler, but it also actually, for various technical reasons, which will hopefully change in the release, it does it work better. So here's a, here's a kind of pipeline that we would do for our Mandelbrot rendering. We, um, the first one is the render. Then we want to encode it to the stream, which is the PNG file, the graphics file, and we want to save that to disk. We need to decide on the degree of parallelism we're going to have now on each of these. On that render, we don't need any parallelism. Why not? It's already parallelized. What about this guy here? Right, with this one, this is the one that isn't parallelized, so all hands to the pump. I'm going to let it use all the calls. And finally, this guy here, the save, this is the I.O. guy that runs to the hard disk. I'm going to give, on the laptop, I'm going to give it one, one thread. But um, if you had a kick-ass SCSI array, maybe two or three. The other thing we need to decide on is on the buffers. And um, we don't need a very big buffer because let's say we, I mean, it, with larger buffers, it will actually help your, your batch processing times. But smaller buffers help with latency. And I want to illustrate the good latency. So I'm going to use smaller buffers. So we're going to set the buffer to the same size as the degree of parallelism on here, which will keep it quite, quite tight this part of it quite tight. We do, however, need a, a quite a big buffer between here and here. Now, why is that? Exactly. We don't want the CPU-intensive encoding to get backed up if the hard drive gets temporarily behind. Why might the hard drive get temporarily be behind? Well, let's say the user's copying files on the hard drive. They're copying a big file. Do we want the CPU to go cold while it's doing that? Right, so it's, it's great to have a fairly big buffer in here. We do not want the buffer to be infinite because if the hard drive cannot keep up, then we'll run out of memory. So this is why, why these bounded buffers are really useful. So I'm actually going to create 
a, a, a zero buffer there, but put a one in between these two, a big buffer in between here. And I'll also put another buffer right at the beginning on the top to feed that, because that makes it clearer what's going on when we're, when we're observing it. So we'll set this whole network up in, in LinkPad. So here it is, I've created, this is the input buffer right at the beginning. Then we've got the transform block that takes the rectangle and then emits a, ma a rendered frame, Mandelbrot frame. And the function there is just to instantiate that frame and tell it to render. Uh, the next phase is encoding it to the PNG file. And um, here I've set the max degree of parallelism to use all of the cores. I said you're allowed to use, it doesn't mean it will use because it kind of dynamically allocates it, but it, it, it can use up to all the cores. And the capacity again is the same, so we're not we're keeping it tight. That's our IO buffer, but that's the one between the, between the encoder and the, and the saver. Um, and so I'm uh, having 100 frames, I'm allowing it to back 100 frames up. And um, finally, there's our, um, the, the, the guy that writes it to the hard disk. And I'm linking them all together. So I'm linking the input buffer to the renderer and the renderer to the encoder. And you do this at runtime. And it's kind of cool because you can, um, you can unlink things as well. So you can later unlink them and change your wiring at runtime. And that's quite a powerful feature of this. To unlink it, um, you, you, can, you can just dispose that the link to return something that you can dispose. Now, the other thing I've done is that I want to know when the whole thing is complete so I can measure the time. So what we have to do here um, is we have to tell it that when this guy, when you complete, continue by completing the next one in the sequence. Right? So it's a bit of boilerplate code here. And some people have said, well, why don't, isn't there a feature to do this automatically? And they're thinking about adding that in there. So that may disappear in the, in the next drop. So we'll dump them all out, and then we need to feed the data in. So now I'm I've done all this code that, that uh, parses the rectangles. And then we're going to post each one into the, the buffer, and then await its completion. So we'll run that now, see how it goes. You can watch the thing. You can see the encoder, the parallelism. So it's running, it's using as many calls as it needs to, to make sure that that doesn't become a bottleneck. And it got up to about four or five at one point. And, and these two are always running in parallel, which is nice. So we're now down to 14 seconds. We were about 27 before, and we've dropped down down to 14 seconds on a, on a Core i7. So we've got a, a pretty good benefit from that, from that optimization. One thing we didn't see, though, was this I.O. buffer build up. The hard drive could keep up. So in that sense, it was a bit boring. So what I've done is I've got a, I've got a USB stick. <laughs> So we're going to try that and see what happens. Here we are, it's on the G. And I'm now going to change the place that it's rendering to from C to G. And we'll run that again. Now you can watch what happens to the buffer. <laughs> but the interesting thing is it actually can keep up in the long term. This is a temporary thing. So at no point has it stopped the encoding. You watch that encoding is still going while that buffer's building up. Imagine that if we'd done, taken the old approach, and if let's take a look at the total completion time, it's hardly added anything. It's added like less just a second and a half to the time it's taken to, to complete. But you imagine instead if we rendered it all to the hard drive and then copied them to the USB stick. How much would that add to our workflow time? Doing it this way, it's added almost nothing. We've interleaved it beautifully. And we've also got the ability with this, um, with the async stuff that I'll show in the next session, to um, put that, um, someone was talking about IO completion ports. We can tell it to do that asynchronous writing to the hard drive in such a way as it doesn't block any threads. So we're not giving the wrong message to the thread pool. And that way, we also maintain very good scalability by doing that. And that's quite v fairly easy to do now. So we'll, go, we'll have a look at the, we've, we've looked at all the um, execution blocks, action, transform, transform many. Um, we'll look now at some of the, the joining blocks. And the joining blocks kind of work with multiple items. And they're actually fairly simple conceptually. A batch block 
grabs multiple items from an input sequence. Um, and this is useful. Let's say you can only do something if you've got three items. Um, so what this does is you can set it up with a batch size of three. It'll grab three items and then dump them off to someone else who wants them. Let's say you're making a circuit board. You need three resistors to make the circuit board. So it grabs three and it packages it off to anything else as, a, as a, an array of three, three items. Now join block works with multiple sequences. So it grabs a single item from multiple streams. So let's say you need a capacitor, um, a resistor, and a transformer to make a circuit board. You can connect to three of these things and it will grab them and it, as a tuple and it will outmit a tuple of, of items so that a, a recipient now has a package of all those items. There's also one called a batched join block which combines the two. So if you need three resistors, two capacitors and a transformer, you can use a batched join block. Now, joining blocks by default are greedy. And what that means is when items come in, it just grabs them. So let's say we've got the blue and the red, but we're waiting on that yellow to come in. It's just not happening. Maybe, what if these blocks here were linked to other blocks that could actually be doing something useful with these items? Uh, this is not necessarily good for, for, for data flow. It's sometimes this is what you want, but sometimes you'd rather it did grab items unless it knows it can get a whole batch. So there are some scenarios that require a non-greedy behavior. And what you can do is configure it as non-greedy, and then when items become available, instead of grabbing them, it defers them, it postpones them, and says, not yet, but maybe later. And once it's got a whole set, it then grabs them all. Can anyone think of anything that could go wrong with that system? Another block could take the one that exactly. Another block could come in and, and take an element in the time after it's got a whole set, by the, by the, between that and the time that it grabs them. And so how it gets around that problem is it uses a two-phase commit, just like a database transaction. Uh, and that two-phase commit, it means that the underlying interfaces all these blocks implement are somewhat more complicated than you'd expect. And the reason is that they need to support two-phase commit. So we've seen all the action and joining blocks. Final ones are buffering blocks. Buffer blocks, really easy. We've already seen how that works. It just buffers items up. And you can use this in between other blocks or you can just use it if you just want a producer-consumer queue that's bounded and that doesn't block threads. You can use this as like an asynchronous producer-consumer queue. There's also one called a broadcast block. Now, normally, you know, we've seen that if you have, a, say, a transform block and you link it, say, to two action blocks, those action blocks will compete for items. Only one of them can get each item, right? An, an item can only go to, to one recipient. But a broadcast block duplicates. It either copies the item or it copies the reference to the item, depending on the function you provide. And it allows you to send the same item to multiple blocks. So we've got an item here, and it duplicates it and sends it to multiple blocks. There's something else cool that a broadcast block does too, which is if any of its recipients that you've linked to defer a message, they can't accept it now because their buffers are full, when they come back and ask for it, it will give it the latest message and skip all of those intermediate ones. So in other words, if it can't keep up, it just gives it the latest all the time. And that's useful if you say you're rendering um, video frames and you want to render in real time. If the, rend let's say the, uh, the, the program that displays the frames can't keep up, then you'd want it to skip the odd frame rather than just running behind. And the broadcast block does that nicely. Also called an overwrite buffer in uh, other terminology. And final one is a write once block. Just takes an element, locks it in. That's it. So those are all our blocks. And um, so we've got time to uh, illustrate. I'm going to illustrate the, the broadcast block. And to illustrate that, what we'll do is we'll take that last Mandelbrot example and we're going to extend that chain further. So um, we'll go back to what that, our previous chain. Here it is. Um, we finished with a safe. But what I'll do is I'll turn this into a transform block 
and it will take the stream and it will emit the file name, the part of the file that it wrote to. And then I'm going to send that to a broadcast block and I'm going to send the broadcast block to a delegate that updates an image, a, a, a Windows Forms picture box, so we can actually watch the progress of the pipeline as it's going, the images it's, it's, it's rendering. So let's go back to that and we'll go to the, um, here's the final one with the, the broadcaster. So here's the uh, transform block where we're taking that memory stream and uh, we're now returning the string which is a file name where it wrote and I've created a broadcaster block which uh, just, it doesn't uh, duplicate the, the content, it duplicates the reference. So it just takes that string and just writes it out. And then we've created a WinForms picture box. And what I've done here is um, the action is to update the image location of that picture box to the file name, to whatever, wherever it wrote it. And um, an option that we need to do in this case is because we, we can be on any thread at this point, right, because it's, it's, it's uh, practicing parallelism. So we need to make sure that it updates it on the UI thread right? because WinForms and WPF have an, a, a threading model where you, uh, you must update a control on the same thread you know, on which it was created. So what we can do is a trick rather like with Reactor Framework. Um, we specify a task scheduler in here. And we can, this, this, this bit of code here creates one from, it captures the current synchronization context that's in force when we, we created this closure. So this will capture the, the UI sync context and now it will marshal it over to the UI thread and uh, run this, uh, update this correctly without any thread safety issues. So I've linked them all together. We've got a pretty impressive chain now. And we're feeding all the stuff in. So um, let's run that now and see what we get. <laughs> and see the latency is pretty good. It slows down at the point where it's doing some more compute bound work. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. So I'll talk, uh, well pretty much we can start with questions soon, but um, a final note is that the, the, all these blocks implement interfaces that you can implement yourself if you want to write your own blocks, um, a bit like Reactive in that sense. You can also interplay with Reactive at both ends. You've got as observable and as observer to go between the worlds of Reactive. It works quite well. And uh, final thing are the questions and answers. So any, any questions on um, either parallel programming or, or data flow? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I'm not familiar with Reactive, but one question I asked, and I guess that's mm. Yes. Um, how, do you, how would you compare, I guess, the ease of use between the error propagation between something like Reactive and something like this? Okay, the question was to do with error propagation and comparing it to Reactive Framework. It has a similar model where if an uh, exception is thrown on a block, it then finishes it in a faulted state. So in that sense, it is fairly similar that the scenarios for using this are very different to Reactive. So if you're going to compare usability, it'd be quite hard to compare it because the scenarios tend to be different. Okay, so if one block uh, uh, faults, then um, that will complete that block, and that will, that will most likely, if you've uh, set it up in a kind of batch mode, it will complete the entire thing. So um, you probably wouldn't actually want to get, in that situation, a block to fold at all, so you'd put exception handling in that block, and you'd make it robust. So it would do its whatever it takes to recover from that error. Any more questions? Yes, say, sir.
Okay, the question was regarding CCR and, and data flow. Um, the, uh, you probably come and see me, see me after and I'll, I'll, I'll chat a bit more on that, but um, it is uh, the logical successor to, to, to CCR, although because it's managed, there might be situations where you want an unmanaged library and then it will be logical to continue with CCR, but it is designed uh, ultimately as a successor to, to, the, um, to CCR. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll be, um, uh, join us for the next session um, in the next meeting room and uh, we'll look at async. Oh yeah, oh, all of the code samples are available. Um, if you go to my website, albahari.com, which is my surname, you can download